uh, animal drilling. Okay, so what happened just now was a change here in the get all is previously I have a, I have a uh, half parameter ID, user ID. So I removed that because um, when this transaction's resource class is instantiated with a user ID here, okay, I'll be using this user ID in the context of the user. So long as in the user's resource, when a request comes in to say I want to get transactions under the user and I create instance of the transactions resource with the user ID that's related to the request, okay, then everything I do inside the transaction resource right, should be based on the context of the current user ID. Now you can also look at it in another way is that if I do not have a user ID supplied or this user ID remains as a uh, in undefined value, okay, then whatever I do will not be in context of the user but in context of the whole. So like this get all method, this get all method, this get all method can actually behave in two ways or two different behavior. One is if there's a user ID available in the resource class, that means this user ID has a value of not uh, a valid value, like right? not undefined or not zero, right? Okay then you will call get by user. Now, if the transaction class is, is instanced without the context of a user ID being passed in when you instance it, then this get out method doesn't need to return a transaction based on the user itself. It can return all transactions in the system. So this is how the get out method can behave differently, whether it's in context of a user or not in non-context of a user. So right now, I'm actually Right now, what I'm doing is I didn't put in the other method to say just get everything without user ID. So I'm assuming this transaction resource class should always be dealt, should always be accessed in the context of the user. If I want to handle the case where user ID may be zero because I'm the admin person, uh, some kind of back office to accessing all transactions, right? So what, how do I do that is to initialize user ID to a non-valid value like zero. So I know for sure there's no such thing as a user ID zero. And inside the get all method, I'll check if this user ID is not equal to not equal to zero. Okay. Do this. Okay. Maybe I should be create a new model here first. So this part is, I, inst I create instance of the model to return. Okay, nothing inside, data is empty array, the next, is, next doesn't go anywhere. Now the user ID in this transaction resource class happens to have a, va a value not, not zero, which I assume is a valid value. And I would think that you now the transaction resource is operating in the context of a user. So it's been invoked from a user's, and user's uh, path onwards. Then I will do I will call the method to get by user. Else, if it's not in the context of a user, then I will say get all. Can I get all method? So these are the two different paths that the code can run, depending on whether you have a user ID or no user ID. So far you understand why there's a logic switch here. Okay. So I'm not going to code the one for getting all the transaction now, because I'll focus on the main, main view. Okay, so I've made my changes. Um, so later I'm going to test users based on user ID transaction, whether it works or not. Um, Cause I think I also need to maybe put some. I probably need to put some uh, transaction values here, uh, valid ones. Uh. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's go to transactions. Add transaction here. Okay. Uh, yep. So publish this first. <coughs> Okay. 
So I'm going to use user ID 7 as a case. Okay. Just join. And let me create a method for post transaction. So before I do this testing, I need to have some transactions here, here for John. So simply transfer. So there. We find the old code.
looks forbidden. So what happened just now was when I created my own constructor for user ID, uh, I still need to create an empty constructor. Otherwise, the Java wouldn't be able to instance this method, this uh, class. Okay, so let me top up some, throw in some values. Okay, um, so let's save this one. Okay, so now I'm going to go to okay. get user by ID 7. Okay. okay, so this is John. Um, so I'm going to get his transactions. Did I have authorization? Oh no, okay. Later I added it. Uh, just two seven. Okay, oops. I hit a snack. Uh, server error. Okay. <clears throat> No problem, look at the log file. URL is not true. Okay. What is this? Okay, get my tail up. Okay, so what is the error? Because I have message body writer not defined or found for XML. Oh, okay. <clears throat> message body not found for XML. Interesting. Global recycling transactions. Ah, okay. Because I previously set up this thing to do content negotiation, it means I can return XML uh, or JSON, right? And I happen to have not set up any XML annotation for the object, so you complained. Okay, so very simple. Um, XML root element needs to be there. I think that's the minimum that needs to be there. Let's try. Still no. Transition uh, model is here. Okay. Just this one. Okay, 
anything else I need from this? You shouldn't need to be hired. Still error. Hold on. <clears throat> hmm? Method not found for text plane. Got it. Clearly, if that's the case, I should allow it to be both ways. <coughs> okay. Well, nothing. Get all user ID, page size. And my response is uh, empty object. Try to debug this. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Ah, yeah. Should I know why now? Because I'm calling B2. Seven, correct.
Mm. Like, how do you get the forget to tell which line? Of okay, so to get a program to tell you the line that the line has problem, or rather what I'm doing is I'm adding a breakpoint. So if I say you get um, okay, that means the compilation doesn't have an error. Okay, everything runs through, but then the output is wrong. Okay, so this is one kind of error. is a lot quite logical error. So logical error means there's something in your about your code. Okay, so normally to track logic errors, we set breakpoints. So to set a breakpoint in Eclipse, you just right click uh, or double click or double click on the left hand side this bar here. Okay. So notice that normally, so normally if you don't click this bar area here, you see that there's nothing there, no icons. But let's say I wanted to track the code execution at this line, line 19. Okay. I can double click here, then you see this icon. So that is called a breakpoint. So we go to debug mode, which is the one that looks like an inside. Okay. Uh, you will change this particular view. So this particular view is to help you to debug and see what kind of data has been is flowing through your application, and you can freeze the execution at the line. So sometimes you may create a lot of breakpoints, but you don't know where are they, right? There's this little tab here that says breakpoints. So this tells you where are the breakpoints you created your code to, let's say, trap execution. So normally we trap execution because you want to see what is happening at that snapshot, like what are the variables, what are the values in the variables, then we trap it there. So in this case, what I've done is I created a, a trap uh, or breakpoint here at line 19 inside users Java, which is this one. Now, furthermore, there's also a, another breakpoint I created inside transaction Java at line 36, which is here. So what I'm trying to debug is when I actually call this method users 7 transaction, right? I want to see what actually what data actually flows through. So right now when I invoke from Postman, you know, if it will start blinking to tell you that oh it's going to debug mode right now, or rather it's caught caught the is caught the execution at the breakpoint. So let's say if your breakpoint is where it's supposed to go, then at least it's come some kind of good news that oh your request actually ends up here, which is line 19. So this actually happened. Now if you click on the variable tab on top. This will show you in this instant of request scope what are the variables and what are the values like user id is a parameter that's passed through the value here is 7 which is coming from my of course the path parameter here so this tells you very clearly what kind of values your variables have so you may counter check or oh, why is it right or wrong is it what's expected so 7 is expected Mm, rather the debug debugging process would sort of wait. So when you set breakpoint, it's waiting for the code to reach that line. Oh, okay. Yeah. So postman is more like a trigger, because right now the only way to trigger your what happens is if you get a request coming from postman. It's not like your main Java program when you run it, it runs sequentially. Oh. So now line ID. Okay. Right? Then so line so line ID is where it's highlighted is currently where your breakpoint is. So it will stop execution there and then. Look, wait for you to either continue playing, that means the play button here, which is to resume, play through, or you can do a step over and step into. Okay. Until you, yeah, so you can do it until you find your problem, where the problem is. Huh? So right now, my problem is when I'm running this request, right, why did I get a 403 forbidden? Okay. So initially when I request, what happened is that, okay, um, these are my headers, or rather, these are the different values we sent over. And at this point here, I add to this stage user ID. So it's going to create instance of transaction resource class. Okay, so far, okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to carry on playing. That's because I got another breakpoint at transaction resource. So if it works, it will, if it gets that, it will stop there. Okay. So when I carry on playing, what happens is next is that before I, anything happens, we just need a 403 forbidden. Okay, so at this point when we turn the transaction Java here, somewhere here it really hit a 403 forbidden. So it didn't even come into this breakpoint here, line 36. Okay, if you remember the container request filter class, okay, so what the container request filter class is that when the request comes in, it will figure out where are you going first and then check if there's a data annotation and then based on our filter logic, if there's an annotation like this, rows allowed the token must be valid. 
So before it actually hit this, what happened just now was it went, it might have went into the container class filter uh, container class again. So our container filter class would be okay. So because I'm using the JWT token, so this is the filter class that is going to check. Okay. So we're gonna put the breakpoint at the first part, line 24. So this is the beginning of the check. So now I'm gonna run this again. So first breakpoint it hits will be here. Okay. So if my guess is correct, the next breakpoint will be in the JWT filter. So notice the flow, the, the flow of the logic for sub resources that if we pass into another resource class, apparently the container filter class will be invoked and you will check the request, request context. Now if I look at variables, my concern here is the request context. So the request context is calling user 7 transaction. Okay, These are all the values that it's sending across. If I want to look at the header, so for it to have told me that it's a 4-3 forbidden, it might have come back either anywhere here, right? So either the, the token was not valid or the authorization header doesn't exist. Two, two possibilities. So let's, let's um, eliminate them one by one. But you still have to guess. Like, At this point... It doesn't tell you specifically what I'm talking about. So if you don't know, you still don't know. So debugging has a technique. So debugging needs your gut sense of view where, logically, where do you think the problem is? First of all, you need to have a gut sense of view where the problem comes from. Then you set up your breakpoints to, it's like a trap, you know, where does the path, the program flow go to? So if, you're, if you have a couple of hypotheses like, okay, here's my scenario one, scenario two, scenario three. In scenario one, if I put my breakpoints here, well, does it go this way and is the value like that? It's expected or not. But there's no function like spider in Python because the thing is about this time. Okay, so there are two types of uh, code checking. One is compilation checking. That means whether your code runs correctly. So compilation basically is a process where any code written in plain text, the system actually compiles them into base machine, lang machine language. So during compilation checking, you will check number one syntax. So does the syntax work or not? Okay, so syntax is like simple things are like is a colon there, not colon not there. Uh, do you put a space? Or Python do you put a tab? Lah? Okay, do you define a function all these things. Then next thing will be type checking. The functions you have, you pass in the correct type of data. So depending on the choice of language, some uh, require strongly typed means if you say this must be a string, you cannot have anything else, then the compiler would raise up an error. So Spider does that. The next, the next thing you check would be um, so syntax, types, um, then um, programming rules. So programming rules basically some languages have certain rules. Example, some languages say that if you define a function, you must always have a return. Okay, so if you never return something, it will flag out. You never return something. Some languages will have a rule that says if you declare a variable, you must use it. So in depending on the language rules, right, the, this kind of spider or compiler checking will tell you. Now spider, so most compiler checking, like even like spider, doesn't tell you logical errors. Logical errors means you have a bug yourself. That means based on this input of data, this is the your program will give you this and the output. So there's no logic checking for that sense. Basically, you must check your own logic, make sure that you coded certain things correctly or not. Yeah. So even in Java, there's no like so-called tool advanced enough to tell you where you went wrong in your code for logical error. You have to actually check yourself. Now, and, uh, in the programming field, we also have, uh, so we write, so instead of writing, instead of manually checking like this, we also have this concept called unit testing. So unit testing is you write code to test your code. <laughs> Double work. So every function that I write in Java or C sharp or Python, right, I can equivalently write a code to test it based on the input. So every function, so every function is very simple. Input, output. What are the what are the inputs and what's the expected output? So unit testing is a is a concept where you write code to validate your own code. Why? Because when you do your manual checking, you're actually repeating your actions. So instead of you repeating action, why don't you write a code to repeat the action? The reason why we do the, want to do repeat testing is because of uh, we call it retro testing. Example: If you have a car and you change just one of the hydraulics, should you test the whole car again instead of assuming that the hydraulic work, the whole thing should work? 
So this is called retro testing. Retro testing is the concept that if you change one line in your code, you should test everything again. Yeah, this is QC la, or QA, la, part of QA. So if you don't test everything again, you change one line of code. Uh, generally, you're leaving assumptions, you're leaving to it to a lot of chance that things you don't validate will might fail. Any engineering uh, discipline, you should take into account this kind of testing QA, la, even software code. So the reason why we write code to test is to we do it automated testing. So that let's say we all are part of a team, we make something, we, someone makes one line of change, right? The automated tester will actually run this testing code against the program and validate all. So only when everything, all the required unit testing all pass, then the program code will go to a second stage, okay, which is shipping. So right now, before we do is untested. Once it's validated testing, then it goes to the next stage where it can be uh, shipped or deployed to a system to use. So there are actually a lot more um, control in place. Uh, we talk about uh, writing software code, especially when you, you want to deliver something that works and you eventually, like when you make changes, you will straight away like, send it out to the different systems. Debugging is a very personal discipline. Uh, like if you do your own code debugging, like where do you figure out is a problem? So you have to look at it and think about rationally, logically, where a problem can lie. Right. Then you go and set up with points to figure out. So right now my two possibilities is that the authorization header wasn't there, okay, so it gives me a 403. Or the token was is invalid. So right now if to vet to prove either one cases, I can do a step through. Okay. To see where it goes to. So the fact that it actually went to this law of code means that I do have an authorization key. Okay, so as you step through, you notice that the, the variables itself will expand and, and, and uh, collapse. Okay, based on in the required scope, right, the instance, what is available. So in this line here, what, is what are the variables available will be like the token value, this value which I copied from when I get authentication. Okay, so if I have a token, then what happened here is that the token was invalid. Yeah, so this explains why there's a 403. Now, if I'm confident that the problem is, a, is an invalid token, simply I just need to get myself a new token, right? Now, if you want to disable all the breakpoints but still remain debug mode, I go to breakpoints here, disable all them, and continue execution program. So here I got a new token, copy it. I go back to my get request, right? Okay. Write the token, preview request, and do the same. So problem solved, invalid token, result in 403, if I update the with a fresh token, I get my data back. So this is the intended result of the pagination for user transaction. So users at user ID 7 transaction, which is a sub-resource of users, is on page 0, which is the first item, page size 20, and this is the result. Now in this case, because there's not a lot of transactions, or less than 20 transactions, the next naturally will be an empty string. So in the case when you are trying to retrieve this data, there's nothing else to scroll to. Now if I reduce the page size to a ridiculous number like 2, okay. so here we are doing testing. La. So if I reduce it to 2, should I see a next or not? I should, la, by right. Okay. However, it's not appearing right. Okay. So something else logically is going wrong in the code. La. So now we go back and do the amendments based on what we tested that didn't pass. So where the next is not working is here, offset total user account. Okay, so total user account, this was, this remain empty string because the offset was more than the total user transaction count. So then again, if you want to do debugging, you can also do uh, debugging here to find out actually what's the value returned from this function. Okay, maybe this is zero. Okay, so that's why it's never update the value, right? So that means there's a fun there's a, something wrong with this part of the, the function. Okay, so we can try that again. Uh, I'm going to run this. Just confirm my suspicion that no, that line is working or not. Okay, yeah, I think I know why it's not working because I never set the parameters yet.
Okay, so far any questions about the pagination? Okay, um, so Eclipse is very interesting. I actually debugged it and then I updated the code, right? So it asked me to replay that playback. And wait, okay, see whether it gets to the line or not. Uh, question mark will refer to the set. Set one, set two. Yes, so the sequence of question mark is the sequence of the set. The question mark is the percentage. Like percentage, like, meaning. Whether you put percentage, then you put base the reference matrix. Well, I'll cut, like a placeholder, like placeholder, like a mushroom. Okay. All looks okay here. So if you want to see what's the value of count, right? Zero. But exception. Color index out range. Zero less than one. Oh, okay. Uh, column index always starts from one. Notice that Eclipse actually returned me back to my breakpoint after I made changes. It's like we rewind up, <laughs> then we do. Uh, so, correct count value, everything should be working now. Yeah. So, this will be the next page, page from page zero to page one. Of course, if I click on the link and do it postman, right? Uh, it didn't give me error because of the way it's handling the path. Yeah. Okay, let me remove that. So if I change this to the second part of the URL, uh, okay, I got my breakpoints on now. So let me remove them. Continue running. Yeah. So this is page two. And page two. Last page. Hey, so funny thing on the last page, I still have this. Hmm. Correct. Should be it shouldn't be less than. Should be less than or plus one la. Plus one right. Then plus and page size. What about page size? Oh, so okay, offset. So my offset is let's say four zero one two two right or three zero one two two three four four. Total correct cost is five seven. Let's see my total records. So there are five records here. Hmm. Uh, offset page size. Because offset is not the page, eh? it's the exact row. If you're a page size, then so if my offset is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 4, right? So, okay, so at this point, right? Here, my, off, my page is 2. Two times two, my offset is four. Okay, but my total record is five. So what should the logic be? <laughs> okay, because I'm I'm at offset four. Okay, I retrieve from four two records. Where is the end ready? Plus page size. I must pass page size. If this offset pass page size, uh, okay. Forget the logic. Why I have to pass page size? Because I want to look into whether there's another page. Or not. Next page. 
So I need to add a page size to find out, oh, have I actually, is the next page going to exceed, not the current page? Offset means current page. Mm, offset means where the record has start from. Yeah. Mm. So let's say, yeah. So if let's say my record, I have five records. My page size is two. First time I call page zero, page fetch two, right? So my offset is zero. Then I go to page one. So one times two, my offset is two. I fetch two. Okay. Now, now I go to the next page, which is page three. So three times two is six, right? Yeah. So page three is really gone already. Oh, uh, zero, one, two, page two. So two times two, four. So my offset is four. Then four, um, I, I fetch from four, two records, which is only one record, because I got five records. So is there a next page? So take my current offset four plus the two that I refuse to call down, become six. But my total record is only five. So there's no more next page. So my next should be empty. Understand? Get it? Okay. okay, so this is pagination. Some calculation, yeah, a bit of debugging, but it's easy to get out of. Okay. So now we have done our pagination logic. So let me save this as okay. user transactions. Okay, so this is done. So now our point number three is finish. You also realize that our point number six is also finished at the same time. So we're left with, of course, we already have a create transaction. We're left with number five, update status and delete contact. Okay, so update status will be your put method. Um, so for the concept of update status, let's look at our transaction table. So some of you, I think you have implemented some feature like I can schedule a transaction. So there could be a status of transaction like pending, scheduled, okay? Or it's pending because you're waiting for the bank or some third party system to clear, okay? So in the banking world, normally things happen very fast, although there are statuses like transaction sends, transaction verified, transaction complete. So, but it's so fast that we don't really see it on app that you can see when you send money, there's like an in-between status. Okay. So imagine if things slow down a little bit, make it that actually status is happening. So in our transaction table, we will need to, in order to incorporate a status kind of a feature, okay, be it whether you can schedule one or it's just a natural flow or natural order of things, then we need one column here called status. So the status will be left to you to define what kind of status are there or states like pending complete the most simple one you know, it's out but it's not finished yet, then completed okay. so that's one of the simplest status you can uh, design so status here um what should you use what should you use to store status in a table so if you're going very visually like excel then you might store a variable character that means the actual word status but in a true in, in true fashion how things are done is never the case most of the time statuses are kept to very minimal integer numbers or we call it tiny ints so there's going to be like four statuses then you can store a very optimized four bit uh, two bit uh, kind of a tiny very tiny small integer okay but if your statuses have like more states okay, then maybe you can use a bigger number to store them so we try to keep them as optimal as possible as small as possible uh, in MSQL, we do we have like very small numbers that you can store. So the integer by itself here is something like a 16-bit integer already. Uh, we store, we we'll let you store millions of states, uh, okay? But we don't really need that. So you can, you may want to choose something like a tiny int. Okay. So what is a tiny int? Question is. So they allow you to store small numbers to very big numbers, okay? And you to, to make the correct choice, you understand what do they, what does the database mean by small and numbers. So regular integer that you always use uses up four bytes. Nothing compared to the gigs that we're talking about, but this is the maximum maximum value that you can store, whether it's signed or unsigned. Okay, which is what is this? 
uh, two trillion. Uh, okay. So we don't need two trillion states. We only need like very much like, few only. So you can actually choose tiny int, which stores up to 127 or 255. More than enough uh, states. So we use a tiny int. Um, okay. And okay. So status will be a tiny int. Uh, cannot be now. Default will be a zero. So somewhere along the way, we will start to we need to have an idea of what values represent what. Like zero stands for pending, one means complete. Those kind of idea. So now that we have made a modification to the table structure itself, we also need to store update our model here. Okay, so mainly the transaction model. Okay, so we introduce the status. Okay, so when you're storing certain statuses in MySQL, okay, whether in the Java code you need to adhere to tiny int. Uh, normally, we try to keep it the same way. Let me connect them. So if you're using a tiny int in the database, then you should use something of an equivalent. Uh, but it, Okay, the reason why is because if you accidentally do send in a very big value, then we you experience this thing called truncation. Example of truncation that if your database stores a bar chart for 45 characters and you send in something that's 100 characters long, it will truncate 45 characters off. Discount. Okay, then you only store 45. If the database is nice, it will actually throw you an error message. If some databases are set not to give you any, any error message, you will just cut off and then take whatever you can store. For numbers, it is more or less the same. Okay. Now, so if you do control your code properly, in this case, statuses, even though you are going to store a 255 max value in database, this integer, although it's a 32 bit, it's a 16 bit standard, if your code doesn't do anything funny, okay, you shouldn't have experienced any issues. So, in uh, other coding languages, what I normally do is I'll create this thing called a constant. Or in some places we call it enumerators. So enumerators basically is a type of data structure in the code where sort of hard coded there that says, oh, one means this, two means that, three means this. Okay. So in Java, you, I'm not so sure whether you have the same concept or not. Uh, yeah, but you can probably look 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 out for that. Let's see enumerators. Yeah. So enum classes. This is an enumerator. Have you seen this before in basic Java? Okay, so when you create an enumerator class like this, what happens is Java will allocate a special space to, to sort of represent each of these values, low, medium, high. Okay. How it represents them, whether it's gonna be a number or a text, are completely up to the programming language to decide. Now there are other in there are other also um, enumerator class that you can specify low is a one, medium is a two, high is a three. Okay, that kind of a concept. It really depends. So why did I bring this up is because if I want somewhere in the code to properly tell me that status zero is this and status one is that, okay, at least when I in a basic logic when I set a status, I know what I'm talking I know what I'm talking about. Is that man is that of, Always remembering zero is pending once completed. So, if I want to do that, what I will normally do is to create a constant. So, I'll do this, this. So, to create a constant um, or constants where there are some kind of hard coded tag values, right? The structure is the typical structure is to create a package that stores them. Literally a very special constant. So here I'll say transaction status. Okay. So I create a package called constant. It is for the for the purpose of storing anything that has a number and a constant and number type of or text type of constant value. Like as long as statuses. So if somebody will come in my will edit my program and say in the business logic I need to set uh, uh, transaction status to completed. He doesn't need to guess that one is completed, zero is pending. 
you just refer to this class for the list of static constants to give the value. So Okay, I keep forgetting about the constants. Is it public static constant or what? Public static? Final. Final. Oh, final. Okay. Constant is another language. Okay, so final. Um, <clears throat> so pending uh, type right uh, get type right. Yeah, here forgetting so. sorry zero and one okay, okay. so Final can ensure that the value the value cannot be modified, and why I put a static so that somewhere outside, uh, when I want to set a status as pending complete, I just need to refer to this uh, class, and without instancing, without creating sets. Typically, for constants or final values, we will use uh, all uppercase to represent them. Okay, so now if I come back to my transactions, oh no, transaction manager. So in the transaction manager, I have a method for adding a transaction. Because I modify a database structure, I also need to now add this in. Okay. So fifth parameter. So state has. Uh, oh, this is add transaction. Sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry. Let me. I shouldn't do this. Okay. Uh, we want a bit. So when any transaction from the mobile app, I don't want the mobile app to tell me the status. I want the back end to define to, to determine status. Okay. Then the back end will eventually later update the status based on the trigger. So here, where, what what value do I put in? Okay. Okay. So this is the convenience of using constants or final values because I don't want second guess zero one or whatever means right. Uh, where the const the way its name should be relevant enough to tell me what it means uh, most of the time. Okay. So when transaction added default it will be pending. So later on, I will need to create an um, endpoint and along with uh method in the transaction to update it to completed. So let's start from bottom up inside the transaction manager. So here I have a create or add. Okay. So maybe after the add, what I will do is I will create a method to complete the transaction and to send in the transaction ID. So in the complete transaction, my SQL statement is I'm going to look for transaction ID and update the status to completed. So I say update transactions set. So the SQL statement to update a row is to call the update command in a table and followed by set. Set is to what do I change? Status equals to the value that I want to change to. Okay. Now, um, Actually, here I can actually hard code the value in if I want to, right? Or I leave it as a question mark so that I use the constants to fill it. As if, if the constants one day were to change, okay, maybe it's easier rather than changing two places at the same time. Okay. So, the other transaction needs to have a condition because I'm updating a particular transaction ID. So, of course, or to specify the condition where ID is good, question mark again. So here I will set integer. First one is the transaction status completed, and then followed by the ID of the transaction. 
x is to just simply execute. Simple, simple method. I don't, I don't get any feedback yet. Just like, complete it. Okay. So this is done. Um, so now in my transaction resource. After the add method, I will create a new response, a new request method to complete or rather update. Uh, maybe I'll say update complete. Okay. So here will be the ID. So this will be a put method. Uh, rows allowed also. Use up. Okay. So I'm just making it super simple now. The way it's working. Um, consumes doesn't need anything yet. Uh, because I'm not sending JSON data or sending any form data, so I'm gonna use a path. So, street way path will be the ID, and then I'll call TX manager dot complete. <clears throat> okay, I think that's it. So this is my complete or update transaction to complete. Done. So let me push this. Okay, so now, when you have um, you edit, when you adding a new column in the table, especially when you're existing rows, right? Um, just some what I also included in the new column was to set a default value zero. So if you didn't set a default value, right, the status column here all will give you a now database now value. So when you're adding a column, you need to think about what is the default value you should add it uh, or should fill it up. Okay, so let me try to do a post transaction again. Get my token again. Okay, so I posted a new transaction. Let's see it. Yeah, it's here. So state zero. So I'm going to add. I'm going to uh, add one more endpoint in Postman. So this will be the put method. So given if I do know the transaction ID, uh, because it's a running number, not the best, and I have a token. Okay. So do this. Oh. Request and a D cannot be. D. Hold on. Bad request. Oh, sorry. I have the parameter. I have the parameter, but never take it to the path. Okay. Okay. Turn. Okay. So let's take a look at the transition. 
So last transaction has been updated to complete. So this endpoint for updating transaction probably is useful not so much for your mobile application, but maybe from a third party that needs to call API to say complete it. So it's quite common, uh, especially with finance system where you need to talk to a lot of third party like bank clearing or whichever, whatever that might be might have this. Okay. So in this respect, we kind of completed the update transition status. So left one a final item which is to delete content. Okay, so do you want to stop now? Then we finish up delete content, then I will move into the score revision for your test. And for CA2, if anything, we can just schedule time to just consult me. Good. The solution is one year of Yes, uh, I'll take it as the after the Android. Lah. Yeah, so you can stretch away. Actually, 23rd, 23rd. Uh, Sunday. If you need more than 23rd, tell me, then I can extend a bit. <laughs> oh, cause you also need to submit CA2 for the Android, right? Really Earlier. When? Oh, when are you submitting the Android CA2? Nine. 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 Well, then I give on you the third, like two weeks extra. Yeah. After that. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, one by one, one by one. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay, 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 okay. So, uh, okay lah. Then you want me extend until when? Twenty nine, ha. First, ha. First, ha. First of March. Okay lah. Interview whenever you're ready. Okay, just don't try not to ask me for interview after the 20th exam. Okay, you can. Uh, uh, you'll be online. Uh, I won't be physically coming here until maybe a bit later to submit marks. So when will be the interview? Normal interview date will be on the... By right, right, interview should be on the 11th. Because 18 is the test, right? So interviews, if you can, uh, if you're ready, 11th of February should be the interviews. So if you haven't finished, simply arrange with me your online time to go through a call. Online, online interview. Uh, Google Hangout or Skype. Nowadays you can online with it, no need to be physically. I trust that it's you talking to me, not someone else. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, uh, next week onwards. Uh. So, next, next week. so next week I will complete the last recovery here, daily contact. And that's the end, for the, that's the end of the lab. Really. I won't be any more future to, to the, the program. Then we'll focus on revision. That means the exam top, test, test topic, um, the mock test also you go through and then she I can take out I can dig out the past previous previous batch uh, test paper for this to try mm -hmm. okay so I will upload the this version of code into git okay so you all can download and take as a reference uh, Postman or export also. Postman and database, three things. So the code, Postman and database, structure and data. Hmm? One more extra... In the polymer, is it? Oh, polymer inside one, huh? Summer code work. 
I will upload a new one now. Okay, there are two locations. One that I upload to is this place. Normally, I'll up to, upload to this, this location. Uh, normally, I'll upload here. This is GitHub. Okay, so here you can download the thing. The other place I can put up also is here. La. So it'll be a new link. La. With a date, I'll put a date stamp. No? Uh, so you can know it's the latest one. Okay.